and all of a sudden you've got a 400 point unit and 600 points of support. Listen up, Umi. This is a podcast with the most ducker. This is Forge the Narrative. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. We are about Lost Souls podcast. I'm joined by Adam Camilleri. Evening, everybody. And Tanya Gates. Hey, everybody. Real sorry to re- release last week's episode a little bit late. Schedules got all jammed up. Uh, I went to two different conventions over the course of one weekend. <laughs> so you yeah, didn't was cause... sleep? <laughs> yeah. It didn't get released because Paul is lazy and wasn't busy at all. 100%. Normally, I try to get it done, but it was just oh, it was just a little too much. And I, I really wanted to get that show out because it had those two great community spotlight segments. And so it's so fun to have people on, you know, that are really great at what they do out there. You know, come on our show and tell us about it a little bit. So I was excited to get it out. Definitely wanted to let people know that we wanted to get it out on time and why it didn't happen. Please forgive us. So, Nova. Tell us a story, Matt. You've just you've how, how how long have you been back from Nova? Did you get back yesterday or the day before? Yesterday, yeah, yeah. Have you fully recovered? Yeah, today to is strength? no. I'm not. I have not fully recovered, but only because it was just such a good time. A lot of enthusiasm. You could tell people hadn't been there in a couple of years and they wanted to be there, and you know a lot of good activity in the gaming hall and in the the vendor area, the Age of Sigmar area was in a different hotel there was like some of the events that were basically right across the street from the main hotel and we mm-hmm. walked over there every now and then to see what's up some pretty cool people hanging out playing some board games and uh when the age of sigmar tournament wasn't happening and a lot of good social activity the like the hotel bar area was a cool place to hang out saw lots of cool people saw some folks that listened to the show really appreciated it uh, uh hearing what's up you know while i was there and then also hanging out with those folks brilliant yeah, and then talked about Warhammer a lot. You can actually find the coverage up on the Warhammer TV Twitch stream. We stream nine mm-hmm. games. Dude, it's uh, it's a lot. No, Nova was a lot. Even, even <laughs> I was at a tournament and, uh, on the weekend, and I was tracking how Nova was going. And man, you just forget like what nine games does to the mind. I say it, we stream nine rounds as 18 games. Oh, because you were doing two tables per... Yeah. Yeah, yikes. <laughs> it's cool, though. I mean, it really, you got to see some cool elements of strategy. You got to get in some of the minds of some players. We had a list with two land raiders on it. You know, like, there which, was, which faction was that? Chaos Space Marines? Chaos Space Marines, Marines or? yeah. They were using the, the super land raiders. The T9, yeah. Uh, G-Dubs really let the let the handle off on the, the toughness. We've got multiple T9 units in the game now, but only for Chaos so far, which I think is interesting. I would have thought the first T, if they're going to do T9, I thought Big Knights maybe went to T9, but eh, here we are. Just let the bad guys have the extra toughness. Yeah, totally. I, I'm totally down for it. I think, oh yeah, cool. They're 10,000 years old. Give it to them. Did orcs get the extra toughness? They did, but they're not. They got nothing that's T nine. I'm mean, T five since Fury. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, technically, I think Tyranid warriors went from T four to T five as well. Like all that stuff did. All the Raveners and the Pyrovors and the all the bad the stuff. Yeah, all the bad stuff. Yeah. Perspective. So yeah, yeah. All the bad guys. Although Tanya, do you believe orcs are bad guys? See, I think orcs are the purest of souls in the forty first millennium. <laughs> Um, I think they're probably the closest thing that you have to good guys because they're just looking to party, you know? Yeah, there, like, there's, very little, there's very little malice in what they do. They just do it because it's what they do. It's like breathing to them. Exactly. You know, I, I used to think, like, when Tau first got released, like, in, like, 4th edition, I used to think Tau were the only possible good guys, and now that's out the window. Like, totally, you know, <laughs> after a couple of editions, like, no way that the Tau are the good guys can be called the good guys anymore. Yeah, there really are no good guys, but orcs are probably, like, chaotic neutral. Orcs and nids, I think, because they're the two ones that just do what they do, what they program to do, what they are born and created to do. They don't... There's, there's, they're not. You couldn't call what they do evil because the evil, you know, means that you know they're in, intent. They just, they just, they exist. Yeah, I don't think and they orcs do what they all mates do when they or, were. Yeah, I don't think they have any intent. <laughs> yeah, just living right. in the moment. Exactly. That's right. Just living no their best life. Right. All those kings and queens, swarm they're lords. <laughs> in, they're in their lane. They're moisturized and glowing. <laughs> 
<laughs> we should start a new hashtag for like uh if, if you yeah just identify as biomass being my best biomass <laughs> hashtag uh, that's very funny the we in the top 16 there were nine different factions represented so very diverse meta there at the top lovely yeah you like well you i was like gonna to say would anything take you by surprise for for what performed or did really well uh you know the necrons have con- consistently not been doing that great and uh you know i really thought that, <laughs> no. <laughs> i thought holy crap is he, is he serious and they're like no of course no, not. I, I... <laughs> almost got me there <laughs> well i saw i saw going into the pre-ultimate to the top cut round so i was going into round the round of five i believe or the, into the round of six a lot of the necron there was a lot of necrons but because they're all super high scoring they all played each other in the last couple of rounds right yeah but yeah, they ended up only being three in the top sixteen after you know a big chunk did either either get beaten, you know, or ended up had to play themselves. You know, there's it does happen. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of time when when Necrons play each other, it's whoever teched better for the mirror match or whoever went first. Going first for Necrons is so strong, especially in the mirror, because they they can score like fifteen secondary points turn top of turn one, top of turn one, right. not even the bottom of turn one. That's true. Uh, so they just go first, score all the stuff, deny you doing the same on your turn because are on the objectives you need to do those actions on, and then um, off we go. The snowball, the the pebble down the mountain becomes the avalanche. Yeah, the Eldari list that came in second actually with three falcons and an avatar cane. I I didn't really expect that to to go as deep as it did. You love to see it. I love to see the avatar doing good. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just with with like obvious list tech, like something that is been chosen either because you know the player knows it inside and out or because they think it gives them some advantage in what they're going to see out there i love that mm-hmm. kind of creativity and uh, seeing seeing that list perform and then into the hands of someone who really knows the faction uh, that, that was nice so uh, i will say i wasn't surprised by the player you know doing well but i was surprised that that list and that configuration got as deep as it did fantastic there's still room out there for people to kind of innovate within their faction yeah i think that's a lot of what we we were afraid nephilim was going to cut a lot of the flavor out of lists and it was going to pigeonhole people like we were going to see oh this is just the best custodies list and no one ever varies from the accepted best but it hasn't seemed to be the case it seems like there, there may be like 15, 16, even 1800 points of a list that is the best things you can do. But because the meta is so fluid and there are so many different armies that can perform well, people can't just lock themselves in because then they become uh, anti, a, a target for the anti-meta players. People will just be like, well, if they're always playing this, well, I just take this and then I, I win that game or get closer. Was there anything you, you saw was surprising from... Well, so I don't know. I, I'm just looking at the standings now uh, for the Age of Sigmar event because I was interested to see what's performing over I there. See, that was and in there, a different building. I just I really didn't see any of that play. By the time I got over there, well, they were you know they were ready to hang out and do something else <laughs> like, I, like we were. <laughs> Well, because, yeah, they played one less round. They played eight rounds. Um, I suppose that's just the number of players they had, which was still a very respectable 135. But their top eight cut had only one double up. Wow. So they had Disciples of Zench took it all out. Iron Jaws came in second, Seraphon in third, Beast of Chaos in fourth, Skaven Tide in fifth, Sylvaneth in sixth, and then two Daughters of Cain in seventh and eighth. I, that's that's cool. What a spread. Oh, Sylvaneth, I think you check that list out because I've been uh, kind of, well, I've been dragging my feet getting my, my Sylvaneth army modernized. So maybe that'll give some inspiration. In Age of Sigmar, Disciples of Zinch aren't really considered to be that great. However, Anthony Trentinelli is that great. So uh, that yeah. one might be a little bit of like an outlier if you were just looking at the faction itself you might be like hmm that's weird but then you see who it is and you're like oh, yeah it makes uh, sense it's gone. well so the winner here was a guy like caleb walters but maybe he's been maybe they're playing a very similar list or they're close sparring buddies oh, okay so i was i was looking at the rtt my bad easy that's all good well i see those players out there rocking and rolling the hobby on display during the at least on the 40k side, and I'm sure the same is on the Age of Sigmar side, was probably better pound for pound than I've seen it at most tournaments. Just I, I stellar don't know. armies. I don't know about you guys over in the states, but um, in Australia, like the event I just went to on the weekend, was the the best 
per, like per, per capita, the per player was some of the best hobby stands that I've ever seen. Um, my stuff's painted pretty good. Like I think my stuff's painted uh, a, a rung or two above table stand. Like it's painted like maybe a rung higher than parade ready by G dub, you know, a rung or two higher than, mm-hmm. than what they consider is the fully painted good standard. Um, and mine's a couple of levels higher than that. And I didn't even make like, there was 80 players and my army wasn't even in like the top 15 or 20 best painted at that event. It was like absolutely nuts how good some of this stuff was. And uh, yeah, I just, I just had such a good time walking around lunchtime whenever I had stuff set up on display. There was, a, there was a, so you guys know uh, house Terran for Imperial Knights. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's the ultramarines of Imperial Knights. It's just blue, a little bit, a little bit of splash red. And one of those armies won best painted. It was so beautifully executed that it won best painted like the that you can sometimes you can just do like a really basic scheme and just knock it out of the freaking park with like transfers you could have thrown a rock and picked any table it landed on to get them on the stream i mean that's that's what it felt like walking around there at the dome open so is it like the same caliber as Adepticon? Because I saw some of the armies from Adepticon and they were mind blowing. So the the Adepticon team tournament is like the real spec- spectacle. The singles event, I- I'd say for the singles events, this is better. Like the are on per average we're we're better, but uh the team tournament's something else. That's uh, a <laughs> uh yeah, that was uh that's where that was at. So again, I was really impressed. Walking around there and seeing all that stuff. Do you think? Do you think it's because of uh, COVID? Everyone had to take like two years off to get rid of their backlogs and they paint all this stuff up extra good. Maybe so. You know, it's like, yo, I'm sitting here for another week. Let me just uh, get this edge highlight on. I will <laughs> yeah. say, in my local group, that did not happen. Nobody painted <laughs> over COVID. People were like, oh, I'm not going to go play my army anywhere, so why bother? Oh, I legit thought I was going to have this one more army painted during that time. It did not happen. <laughs> Yeah, it was, motivation was hard to come by. <laughs> I did get some stuff done, but like I was expecting just to do a whole army. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. And then, you know, what was your what was your army plan? Like, uh, what, what did you want to get done? Adeptus Oritas. That's what I was going to do. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, it didn't happen though. <laughs> I have a lot of figures. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, boo. <laughs> I know. Shame. I'm ready. I'm ready when the uh, next uh, you know whatever happens. <laughs> what, the next pandemic rolls around I'll, I'll, I'll know what to do that time it may never happen definitely get that that army done uh, no, but it was just a good spectacle loved it loved hanging out the people were cool uh, getting to talk to folks you know that you only see a couple times a year always very cool so mm-hmm. if it is you know something that you feel right about doing I highly encourage you to get out to these events and the next one I'm going to is the uh, US Open event in Chicago that's the first weekend in October, like the 6th through the 9th or something like that's, that. Yeah, it's a month away now, so that's pretty close. Yeah. You're shoutcasting that one? I will be, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be good times. So, I uh, def- again, come hang out. You get to also see the cool stuff. You get to see the Games Workshop store. I, I don't know if anything like the Kill Team Live will be there. But I know there'll be lots of lots of cool painting comp- or classes and everything. The, no- the full run of things. It's kind of like the total experience for a grand. Tournament. And we're getting into the we're getting into really kind of juicy, crunchy end of the ITC season for those competitive minded players out there. Um, things are really starting to ramp up. Like we've got the LGT coming up, which is probably going to be the second biggest singles event in the world. Uh, and then yeah, it's all chugging along until the LVO and the big the big song and dance to wrap up the com- what what is essentially the first full full year of, of uh tournament play event play since 2019 mm-hmm. you know that's another thing if you're uh, wanting itc points wanting faction points these are great places to get them that we're talking about hobby track points all kind of things to get uh, awarded for and we'll be talking about this stuff on the thursday show over on the frontline gaming network ah good plug <laughs> This week we got a couple of options for for what we're gonna we're gonna put on the show. There's two big team events, one in Spain, one in Australia, and then we've got a super a super stack GT also in Australia, and then a bunch of really nice big uh, events in the states and the UK. So actually, sorry, I don't think the UK has any big ones, but uh, it's gonna be a good show as it always is. Yeah, it's always a fun time. That's uh, myself, Adam Camilleri, and Dustin Henshaw oh. over on, if you couldn't guess, the Thursday show. <laughs> and we, we record that live in front of a studio audience. Studio well, I record audience, that but... on Fridays. 
Friday, thank you very much. Oh, so, on your Friday. Yeah, it's, it's misleading. But uh, the, what's going to be interesting is this will be the first week where demons are in full effect. Oh, that's right. You, uh, I guess people would have had it in hands and, and know it. You know, you just people can't wait to get it on the table. I, I'm really excited about this book. Is it weird that this feels like it's four supplements in a trench coat? And I think I've said that on my own show, but it, it like it, like having reviewed the whole book now and gone over it a couple of times, it really feels like it's it, it, it's four books, four individual books that they built to, to, to work together pretty seamlessly, but they do feel like four very distinct flavors, which I'm extremely stoked about. I think it's cool. Yeah, there's enough kind of you know, juicy bits to keep you interested in, in any particular faction, which which I do like. And I will say that I'm, I'm kind of excited about the potential of throwing three great unclean ones at someone like six inches away. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a mechanic that we haven't had to deal with in eighth in ninth edition. It was very much prevalent in eighth edition, where you'd always have to be screening and watching for like everyone had a mechanic that let them arrive from reserve and get a good charge off against you. You know, orcs would do it, GSE would do it, some space marines would do it, arriving from strategic reserve and having three d six charges. I think Raven Raven Guard would, or you know. Um, shadow stepping and all that kind of stuff and yeah now it's like this is the first time we've seen it brought back and mass as a mechanic in ninth edition and people are gonna have to be like ready it's, it's gonna it's gonna change how you want to play the game yeah you have to i mean especially for things this big i mean there is no sometimes limit or sometimes with that kind of things it was only one unit like gene stealers or whatever you only have a couple of different op- real options about what you could do that with yeah yeah um but yeah, now it's just like uh, every, everything in my in your opponent's army could potentially. Well, up to fifty percent of your opponent's army could potentially be doing these things. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't think three bloodthirsters is quite fifty percent. So <laughs> you're fine. Uh, <laughs> but there is that there is that nice caveat that uh, G Dub put the mechanic in with the um, demonic locus that does well. It's not a hamstring mechanic. It just means you've got to be a bit selective with your application and gives your opponent a little bit of like say in uh, how you're going to try and mess them over. Uh, you mean as far as they can maybe identify what your locuses are and do something about it? Where you have to place them, what their where, where their ranges are, you know, stuff like that. Where, where they're likely to end up. Because where, where, they can only move so far and then you can only deep strike off that model so far. So... The idea would be that because people generally will only be able to have one locus per army, depending, um, you can it can be a little bit predictable about where they go, and you can at least have some interplay. Let me help you out with this locus thing. The feculent narmal is a warp locus. Correct. Uh, the feculent who else is a warp locus? Narmal uh, is seventy-five points. Yeah, but see, that's a terrain piece you place on the table, and then you have to deep strike within range of that terrain piece in order to get there. So it's just like, so to me, when you put the, the Narmor down, it's just like, okay, cool. There is a like eighteen inch exclusion zone around that terrain <laughs> piece where I do not go. That is well, that is the the land of death. <laughs> I just think that you can place them up near objectives. Now, the what may be different than in previous editions and versions of this is that this does have a toughness and wound, so you can you can destroy it. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. T7 awesome. uh, not with nine wounds. Spicy. Uh, so it's not like something that's just a, this is not a surefire plan. So w- what you're saying was absolutely true. Like knowing, identifying what the locuses are and then figuring out ways to, to dismantle that potential plan is you know, yeah. got to be number one thing on your opponent's mind. If you like, well, so the, you tell them you put three bloodthirsters in reserve. Yeah. The real cute thing here is though, there's one um, locus that isn't on a greater demon in the book. Well, and not on a train piece. And that's on a Slanesh Herald, the Enrapturous, I think the one with the really cool harp made of nerves and, oh, and yeah. stuff uh, so that's the only one that you can you can like it can be bodyguarded it's, it's under 10 wounds so you can put run that up behind the rest of your army and then deep strike stuff and then that one can move advance out and then deep strike because every so other gross. one essentially yeah it, it, oh dude it's so cool there was such a chat for a long time about people like some grognards grumbling about uh chaos getting losing losing how kind of messed up it is losing the the vile and the the scary factor of chaos and then that model came out and they're like oh yeah this is fine this, this, this is right. <laughs> back, back on track <laughs> it's, it, it, it's fine because <laughs> that's right because like slanesh uh, supposedly took a back seat to the skaven god the great horn rat yeah great horned rat mm. which was uh, i i wouldn't mind would you, how how would you guys be if they great put the great horned rat in um in 40k 
Why do you think the Great Horn Red is not in 40k? Because I don't know. It doesn't have rules, I guess. It's not. I'm almost positive. It's not one the, of the four supplements wearing a hat. At the end times, the Skaven like looked into the 40k universe, and they were like, "Yeah, no, this is too messy, even for us." I <laughs> know. I think they. I. I. I I'm not positive because it's been a while since the end times came out, but I think there's some reference to 40k in the Skaven. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. So, also, well, has anyone if realized? That's the case, if that's the case, though. Shouldn't Kaldor Drago end up in Age of Sigmar? I would love that. I is this... I think there, <laughs> there may even be a reference to something like that <laughs> as well. Like oh, I think please. y'all hit on a couple of Easter eggs. I mean, these are this could just be internet speak and uh, conjecture and wishful thinking. <laughs> oh, that would be fantastic. I'm I'm all about it. I don't think it's too what far if, off the mark. Here. What if what if Sigmar is actually Kaldor Drago? Yeah, it's just <laughs> could be. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, with the warp locus, I did not catch that it was on the infernal and Raptorous. Yeah, it's a big deal. That that's the one I think that gives Slanesh a lot of spice for the. Um, I guess it's the the list where you don't want to take you know be all in oops or greater demons. Um, because I do think there are plays for the greater demon lists, and there are plays for the a, a bunch of the smaller units. Although G Dub, um, I made a comparison that G Dub was doing something they haven't done with demons with this codex, which was incentivizing the middle tier demons. I think the the previous book in Eighth Edition really incentivized all the demonic infantry, the lesser demons. You know, the blood letters, the the horrors, especially sorry, especially the horrors and the bloodthirst uh, and the plague bearers um, became staples of Eighth Edition. Um, and then um, the blood letters as well to a lesser exp- extent but the the demoness really didn't leave a huge mark outside of a few niche like all in builds um and now i feel like this one's going down the route where you want a bunch of flamers you want a bunch of uh you know beast of nurgle or plague drones you want a bunch of fiends and flesh hounds like it's really cool to see some like G-Dub spreading the love around a bit and being like, hey, what didn't what didn't people take at all last edition? Well, let's make let's give them some love. I don't mind that. Plus, I mean, you know, give some variance in the in the list that you're going to see. So uh, I guess the um, what I mean by that is the silhouette of the armies that you're going to see, which would be cool because you'll have your troops, you'll have you know a decent amount of you know, elites and bigger profiles and stuff like that, and then you'll have some HQ leading it most likely. Well, yeah, and also it it is informing you to do the only rational thing to do in the modern era of the game, which is to have a complete collection of an army. Don't, don't just go 2000 points of a, of an army, get flesh it out, have a bit of everything. And therefore, you know, whatever changes out there, meta wise or game wise or rules wise, you'll always have something you can enjoy. Yeah. We heard even that talking to our, our faction specialists last week with, you know, no, I was prepared. I already had a bunch of demons, you know, so perfect. No problem. <laughs> But that's kind of way. That's not. It's not a reality for everybody to have a bunch of extra models all the time. But it is kind of cool when you are, you do kind of insulate yourself from addition changes or codex updates or whatever. If you have kind of a, a big stack of stuff either on your hobby shelf waiting to be done, your pile of potential, or in your your painted arsenal. Totally agree. Uh, someone was been telling me like all on Hornicus Slimax is supposed to be really good. Yeah, this one of my favorite models in the range. Yeah. Um, in the demon range. Absolutely awesome. Uh, do, I mean, do you know why pe- people may be hot on this guy? Uh, so, ooh, apart from his uh, innate beast buffing ability, and beasts seem like a very powerful data sheet, I'm not sure if their points cost is going to be enough to keep them down because they are they are quite expensive. At 80 the the beasts are 80 points, and he, he does let Beast of Nurgle or Plague Drones reroll charges made and then also add one to the attack's hit roll. So he is a, he is a pretty big buff character. It's pretty good. Yeah, I'm I'm all about it. I think he's awesome, and the model's fantastic, and the rules seem pretty good. So yeah, absolutely right there. I guess that's right. You can just bust everybody. So here, uh, Legio's uh, Demonica Nurgle core unit within six inches of this model. Each time the model in that unit makes an attack, you can reroll wound roll of one. And then he has a beast handler, which does all the stuff we were just talking about. He does some other stuff too. Basically, he does stuff yeah. in the terrain. He's got, so I guess we just answered that question. He does a lot of stuff. He does a lot of stuff. And you know, it reminds me of um, Never Ending Story. So you know, that that's got that's got points on it as well. Because <laughs> he's the snail rider. All right, that's right. Nice. Would Horticulus Slimex be considered a force multiplier? And can you please explain to me what exactly a force multiplier is? That's a good question. Uh, 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 very, very good question. Yeah, I think you're. Uh, I think you've hit it there. Is that sometimes that that term just may get get uh, thrown around? Anything that gives you um, more value out of 
more than one thing. So the fact that it is, he gives a, a buff to any friendly model within six is, I think, enough to kind of call him a force multiplier. And with the bonus in the command phase, be able to buff up a unit that you might already want to take, although I don't think that's a prerequisite with the force multiplier. Uh, I think the anything that gets you something that like one unit can punch at one and a half times efficiency or two times the efficiency because something is, is by, you would call them a force multiplier and like an actual force multiplier. Uh, it, it speaks to how we categorize different units as well. Um, a lot of... A lot of units in 8th edition were kind of one or the other. They were a false multiplier or they were a beat stick or they were a, um, a support character. I suppose a support character would be something like a chaplain or a librarian, something there that gave out a single buff or a double buff. A false multiplier, I think of as somebody who gives out an aura or buffs a exclusively buffs a unit of, like in Horticlux's um example buffs all of something within range uh like something that gives it out an aoe effect i usually classify as a force multiplier and then you have like at the upper extent of unit choices you know things like your your primarchs your you know supreme command takeable options they become you know multiples of their beat sticks plus support characters plus um force multipliers gilliman's a great example you know is a monster a beat stick is a I also also you can put in the fridge as well. Like there is an option for a carry for a, a, there to be at the fridge kind of. Uh, I put that in air quotes. When because remember Lysander in uh, like Are you fifth referring and sixth to uh, Calgar or Torgeradon? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we used to call Lysander. Uh, well, I don't know if this was ubiquitous around the world, but back in the day when we were playing in like fourth, fifth, sixth edition, we would call Lysander uh, the fridge because he had a storm shield and Terminator armor with Eternal Warrior. Um, as in, like he couldn't be, he oh, could not right. one shot the guy. Yeah, okay. And so he was the fridge. You had a problem unit, march Lysander in it, and he'll keep it there all game. So there is that option out there as well. But that's kind of going away a lot. So a false multiplier for me is something that gives out an AOE buff or gives out an exclusive buff to multiple units. Um, it's something that takes a unit that I already want to take and makes it better. Um, and whether that's worth it for, in, in your mind, you know, so be it. I suppose this gentleman or the people who are high on on on, on Horticlux are high on Horticlux because they're high on beasts, they're high on on plague drones. They're like, this guy is worth it because the things the the things he does is relevant to the units I want to take. And that that'd probably be how I classify. But it's it's, it's actually a really good topic, Tanya, um, to bring up because the way we weigh these things up is really important. You remember Eighth Edition? guys like you'd have a you'd have characters in your army that were exclusively there to do killing I'm, I'm talking about like blood angels smash captains you'd have uh units in your army that were there to exclusively buff and activate units you know like company commanders platoon commanders um librarians uh the ancient that used to make things shoot back on death on a two plus false multiplier you know um so yeah it's really cool it's, it's a topic or a, a a little a little piece of nuance so we don't really delve that deep into all that often yeah it's just a term that i hear being thrown around and like i thought i understood what that term was but then i've also had people be like oh no no that that character is not a force multiplier so i'm like oh i actually don't know what this means then yeah. so <laughs> i look at anything that can that can does not but you know really just have one target for its stuff and and there's a lot of chaos stuff that way and you can even put it on something like you know the fight's last ability is a force multiplier because it makes sure that you're going to get to do your stuff. Yeah. I suppose that we get to the discussion of, you know, how much of your army can you have allocated to force multiplication before it takes away from just having enough stuff to be relevant. Like I like Death Stars, yeah, back in in seventh edition, not not so much relevant uh, in eighth, but you would take one unit. Death Stars. <laughs> you would, t but what I mean is, like points wise, you would take one unit of Flesh Hounds, say ten of them, uh, equating to you know probably a hundred ish odd points, maybe less, probably less than one, less than one fifty, and then you would add in. 600 points of characters you know that kind of stuff because you, you'd add in five sorcerers maybe a chaos lord you know um and then that army would also have fate weaver and a demon prince or some some crazy crap like that and you know that it would become an unkillable object uh we don't have quite that extent in 40k but we do have equivalents and the perfect one you said there paul was chaos chaos terminators right now a 10 brick of terminators you can spend 400 points on that 10 brick of terminators and then take a baden for 300 points take a dark apostle for a hundred odd points take a master possession for a hundred odd points take a a friggin um 
a regular sorcerer for 100 odd points and all of a sudden you've got a 400 point unit and 600 points of support I'm trying to figure out if that's bad or not in my head right now oh well, it's it's actually not it's doing really well but I mean, <laughs> there is a line where the, the juice the juice isn't worth the squeeze so to speak <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk uh, more random stuff. See you in a minute. <laughs> more random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Summed up nice. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey, everybody, we are back. Thanks for checking out our sponsors. Uh, please don't forget to leave us a five-star review. You can also leave us five-star reviews in Spotify. I know we talk a lot about iTunes and, and the other aggregators, but Spotify is someplace if you are listening to us brand new, hit that five-star review. It means a lot. That's like a real easy way that you can kind of telegraph that you like the show and maybe some other people will find the show and it makes our hearts swell. <laughs> it does. It just livens up my day. I check every day. I'm... <laughs> Constantly. And if you just, leave, it, if, refresh. if you leave a really sweet comment, then he shares it in the group chat with us, and then we all go, "Oh!" It does. It's actually really <laughs> nice. Um, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, that does brighten my day. Yeah, so thank you all for that. All that have done it so far, and that we'll do it in the future. Um, Adam, in the in the pre-show, you brought up a great topic: is you know how do we as the player community uh, judge the success of a codex? You know, of a brand new something, some brand new release, you know, major release like a faction or something in the community or just yeah, as a whole. it's become it's become pretty apparent that we're well, we're almost at the end of the codex releases for this edition. I think we've got what Votan, World Eaters, and Guard that they've um, that they've said are you know going to be take us take us till the end of the year, and then I mean. Uh, past supplements and possibly redoing some bits and pieces like maybe they do space marines again because they did it last edition maybe that's a pattern they're doing main boys get two uh, but apart from that we're, at the, we're coming to the crunchy bit of the edition where we have to look back and see you know how do we how do we evaluate the success of a, of a of an army book how do we say whether this one was good that one was bad indifference you know this one's a pass and a fail etc cetera, etc cetera. do is it even valuable to do so you know um coming from a rev, my own show is a review show where i do rate um codexes i would love to have a discussion upon you know what we measure how do we how, what, what is the measuring stick for success like how do we determine whether it's it's a book that was good for the player base bad for the player base etc cetera, etc cetera. well with i mean like with balance updates and that kind of stuff i think it's kind of cool to evaluate this stuff from time to time to see you know what you know i don't want to say isn't balanced or isn't good but what you know what is not hung in there or is punching it you know at an equal weight to everything else that's been errated so i mean that's no reason not to look back so i think the evaluation is going to be different based off why you play the game like what's important mm. to you about playing the game right so if you take the orc codex for example when that came out and then the orcs had that one specific type of build that was just oppressive. A lot of competitive players would say that the Orc Codex is a great book, mm. right? Because you could make a list and that list could go and win you a GT. Perfectly said. That's definitely one of the metrics that you, well, we should be asking ourselves, like how important is internal balance and, and where, and, and how well do we weigh that up? Because for the, uh, is anybody able to define what internal balance is for people who may be unaware? I mean, I would say internal internal balance in a codex is when you can see a use for every unit or pretty close to every unit in the codex. Mm. If you can pick up your favorite unit in your army and you can find a place for it in an army list and it could be somewhat effective, I would say that that is an internally balanced codex. Yeah, it's, it's how... Uh, I. In the simplest way, probably, is to say it's how well fleshed out it is when measured against each other, unit to unit inside the same book, right? right. Um, and, and how many different sub-factions and how many different stratagems and relics and, and, and wall of traits, et cetera, you find a reason or a, a purpose for. Um, and we have examples of very good ones, um, and I think you gave an example of one that was a little bit lacking because apart from that – was a, it was a free Buddhist list you were meant, you were referring to, yeah, upon release of the Orc Codex. Yeah, and it had like the planes, and I think mm -hmm. it had mech guns and buggies. 
there's a few different types of builds, but that was sort of like the uh, the trope or yeah, the archetype. Yeah. Uh, and yes, spot on because once once that went away and it, it did need to go away, uh, yes. orcs have never found another build that gave them even a, a percentage of that success um, at the top level. Of course, we're, we're we're talking about this through a lens of relative competitiveness because. That's where you find out. Well, that's what just one metric to, have to, to judge by. I mean, if we're talking about yeah. success of things, and I mean, or if it was successful in in the eyes of the player base, kind of thing, or the fans of the factions, and what to look yeah, for. On my show, I generally um, rate upon two metrics. We talk about, and one of them, I, I simply say, how good do you think this is for the players of said faction? So I just did the the final review of the Chaos Demons, um, second half of the Chaos Demons book, and I asked. The, the gentleman I reviewed it with, um, how good do you think this codex is for the player base? Um, and they, they gave me a score out of 10. A five would be, it's exactly the same as the previous book and therefore a pass, like, or a minimum pass. Uh, below five being it's worse than the previous book, above five being it's better, and then, you know, why, why, why not, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other one being, you know, where it's going to sit competitively because that's, it's a, it's on a competitive network. But uh, those are two metrics that I find are very pigeonholed uh, because of the format of my show. And yeah, I'd really love to get some more perspectives. Like, how do we rate how good a codex is for a hobbyist or hobbyists or collectors? Like, is, is internal balance a good metric for that? Because there's a lot of reason to buy a lot of different models and therefore have a beautiful collection, have a lot of hobby opportunities. For me, I think it, I think it is. It's important. I mean, that is a consideration and I look at it and it's very much in line with my opinion of that to judge whether or not a codex is good or great is the depth within it. And as a, just a, for instance, and to kind of support the example uh, that we're kind of talking about is in years past, you know, like the Tau codex was, mm. you could, you could build a very good build out of it, a list build. But if you stray too far from that, then you did not um, get the same results on the tabletop. So, so you're saying that was an example of poor internal balance, but the top end was always pretty up well, there. It was a good codex because if you were a Tau player, you could play something in my mind, because I'm judging everything from a, you know, what do we see on the, the, the tournament tabletop also, you know, not yeah. necessarily. I mean, you can, when you're playing a, a, a game or, or a narrative, you, you know, any other kind of experience outside of a tournament, you can set boundaries on, you know, whatever you think should be in a list or shouldn't be in a list or scale for certain things. But, you know, when you're coming to a, you know, what we now know or we're now referred to as a match play event, uh, there's, you know, th those rules are defined. You can't like, Hey, in, you know, in round four of the event, you can't be like, Hey man, I really prefer it. If you didn't take three riptides, you know, that kind of thing, you can't have that conversation. <laughs> I mean, you can ask, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, but it, just, it wouldn't happen. So I, you know, I looked at, I looked at it as the codex was good because you could play something and it was very powerful. There was a linear, but there was a linear path to that power. And if you stray too far off that, you were deluding yourself. The, the, you've kind of fell off the cliff and you couldn't hope for those same results. And so uh, I think that's a, what separated it from being a great codex is that there just wasn't that depth. Whereas mm. we have a lot of great codexes, in my opinion, now is that there are... Uh, you know, different paths to a list for you to go out and play and be successful. But there's a lot of different components to that. Like we have been through now a couple of balance updates and, and, um, you know, point changes and the secondaries for missions, you know, those are, I mean, I know they're now a result of codex secondaries or now Nephilim secondaries, but at the same time, uh, do we do we consider the updates in this discussion? Or are you just talking about at release? I think it's well. I think uh, to get it to a place of stability before we we have to get it really well defined before we start taking the the, the updates into account. Because then essentially you have to reevaluate everything upon a set metric every time there's an update. Yeah, like has this changed where where they were? Because we need we need to establish where they were upon release or how good it was, and then you slap on the patches. Which in my I always I I've been calling them patches the the data slates the chapter approved like they're patching the codex they're patching the game like they would you know a League of Legends or a um you know a, a Starcraft, but uh yeah I think I think we need to set the criteria and then be willing to be fluid as the the edition unfolds and as the game changes, and so you have like a, a start and an end point, but you have a journey between the two for for the life of a book 
and I think it's really important to to stay on the to ride the wave, so to speak. But there is one metric that I want to capture that I've never really figured out how to do, and it's the it's how thematic a book is, how thematic an army feels um, when you put it on the tabletop, which I think is something that G Dub has done a great has, has done really well. It's it essentially in my mind it's. Sixth edition was the last time I remember a book coming out and feeling super thematic to how I felt they played. Fifth edition, I think, was the heyday of that. And then sixth sixth edition, we lost it a bit. Seventh edition, we lost it a lot. Eighth edition, we lost a, a, a bit of it, but not. it started coming back. And then ninth edition, it's back with a, a vengeance. Books feel like you think they should. You read the you read the fluff and then you pay the army. And you're like, this lines up. Like I think Death Guard's a perfect example of that. Gene Stiller Cult's a perfect example of that as well, where you read the fluff, you get immersed in the, the story in the background of an army then put it on the table and it lines up with what you imagined and that's that's something that i want to be able to capture when i ask people how good do you think a book is that should i do you guys feel like that should be a metric that we we value in this hobby yeah maybe we get this like a, a you know five categories that we assign you know i don't know you know it's subjective but to a codex i think theme and uh uh, yeah, expectations yeah. of the lore should be one of those. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. What about you, Tanya? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really important. Like, I think my, I think maybe my biggest concern, I have a lot of concerns about like the old guard codex. Can't wait for a new one. Um, but my concern is that it's really sort of hard to flood the board with bodies in any sort of meaningful way that kind of reflects how the guard actually work. Also, mm. it's it's a little bit difficult with like list building to make tank companies work the way that you think that they should based off of the lore. Um, yeah, obviously, well, the- when you're playing competitively, it doesn't matter. You're not going to play them that thematically because it's not... Um, it's not conducive to winning games, but if you are, um, yeah, if, if you are a lore player, you kind of almost don't want to mix infantry and, and tanks, right? Because that's not how, that's not how the, the sort of structure of the Imperial Guard works. So I would say that is probably a, a big concern for some people. Hmm. About, yeah, about that, that metric being, you know, this just isn't a possibility because it's just not how the competitive game is played. So therefore it's not a, it's, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's not a value to everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the, the whole reason I, we make good codex yeah. is coming out. I mean, that's, uh, that's my actual opinion here is that there has been a pretty good mix between uh, theme and then now with the secondaries getting a lot of attention. It's not only just theme, it's that you can play into what is good about your army and you're going to score points during the course of the game. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of how the, the, them using the secondaries to assist in making things feel a certain way, adding flavor through how and, and crafting secondaries and the missions to make people want to play the game in certain ways. I'm a huge fan of that because you can, sure, you can take the best things in your codex. You could minimize, sorry, you can min max and optimize whatever you want. But if it doesn't re- result in points on the board, you're actually just going to lose a lot in the current edition. And I think that's exactly where we want the game to be. Yeah, we're seeing that actually happen. Well, yeah, Necrons is a perfect example. Like that, Necrons is an army that I would say has a very thematic book but not one that has good data sheets. Like they're, they're underpowered. Like they're, they're, the power on their, when you, when you look at their units and you compare, say, any one of their um, melee units, flayed ones, you know, so to speak, compare them to Repentia, essentially. Neither of them are, are troops choices. They both occupy kind of the same slots in an army and supposedly for the same purpose, yet these two things cannot be compared. They don't line up in any way. Repentia are just hands down better across every metric. Uh, and yet, you know, the Necron army, the way it plays on the table is extremely rewarding. And the fact that it, they have weaker units doesn't matter because everything that they do results in a huge scoreline. So even if they are dying, even if you are getting punished, if what you're doing is rewarding you with points, you're winning games. I don't think it's fair to compare anything to the Repentia. <laughs> no, me either, mate, me either. That's why I use them, because they're, they're like the top of the, the pile. Po- point for, they, they are like in they their have own some nightmares, part, so to speak. Yeah, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's funny. So, I mean, I guess with this, uh, it, the Codex is like, what what's the successful Codex and what it means yeah, that I think it is, I mean, with the variance that is supported in there, uh, you know, there's things we're not even talking about. The crusade rules, the, yeah. you know, the open play stuff, you know, narrative play stuff. Like what is, 
you know, there's so many different levels. And mm. I know we talk about largely about efficiency of list. I don't even necessarily competitive, but what are value choices, efficient choices, and how to build a list that will win more games than it loses. And there's one last metric that I, I don't think there's any way to capture, but I think it's possibly the uh, possibly the most important one. And that is how much passion a book inspires in the player. Like there's nothing that will make somebody get a big, uh, like from GW's, and this, this is purely from, from Games Workshop's point of view, nothing will make people buy a book, play a book, for, play a book for a, a full edition, buy a whole army, paint it beautifully, then being passionate about the game and about the, the rules that they've been given. I have no way that I know to measure that apart from asking people's opinions. But if you could, we could capture that in a bottle, like that passion, because that's, I don't know what fuels other people out there, but passion for a faction is what lets me play it for an entire edition. I played guard all the way through seventh edition, all the way through eighth edition. I've played dark angels, only played dark angels in ninth edition because I, it's an army that I'm extremely passionate about. And if without that passion, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stick on an army for more than like a couple of weeks, couple of months. So I, I'd love to know how we capture that in a bottle and how that's one thing to we rank. get, we, we can rank uh, what faction players we think are the most passionate about their army. It's, it's definitely Ooh. orcs. It's yeah. definitely, I was about to say, does anything even come close to orcs? Like second orcs is space wolves. <laughs> Dude, I have both a, of those. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good call. Space wolves players. That's a good call. Yeah, and there's probably uh, a lot tied for third, but, yeah, I think I think there's it's more branched out into super factions now because you have I have I know people who just play Hive Mind like they just play GSC and Tyranids that's the only two things they will play. Um, but I suppose that's one of the great things G Dub did with the the whole I, I, and they don't they don't call them super factions. We the players call them super factions like Chaos. I know so many chaos players who used to play only play chaos space marines and then eighth edition when the game started changing you know sometimes month by month uh they expanded to play a couple of the armies in the adjoining factions you know um it's possibly one of the good things that came from seventh edition when seventh edition incentivized allies people's people everyone got like 500 points of demons when they're a chaos space marine player they got a magnus you know, they got a Mortarian when it came out. And now in 8th edition and 9th edition, now they have armies of those factions. Like they have 2,000 points of T-Suns. They have et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Um, but yeah, no, you're not wrong, mate. Like who's at the bottom though? Who's If we're going to if we're gonna do the top, who's the least passionate? Least enthusiastic about yeah. their army. Yeah. <laughs> that they own 2,000 points of at least and have painted and have spent so much time with. <laughs> Uh, well, I, uh, I don't think that you can put anybody at the very, very bottom. No, I'm, I'm going to do it if y'all won't do it. Just oh, do it spicy. Unless, yeah, uh, add mech players. Ah, uh, uh, picked it, picked it. Good. I was going to, yeah, 100%. It's got to be right. And why do you think that is? Oh, because uh, you, like, you just had to pick somebody at the bottom. There's so many cool factions. And, and even, <laughs> like, there are people that, I just came from one of the conventions I went to this past weekend. There were already tech priest cosplayers out roaming around phenomenal so even even what we're saying is might be the least passionate <laughs> players are uh, still pretty darn passionate well they've had it removed right their passion yeah. replaced they, they by removed it cleanse tubes <laughs> Been replaced with binary code which has no place for passion yeah it's a, t- it's a tough metric there but, but I, I think that there is something about that like you want the lore to grab people and that's one of the coolest things about the like warhammer stuff in general is the lore there's people that don't know a thing about the game or the figures but they know stuff about the lore has uh has anybody started echoes of eternity yet uh, i downloaded it i'm gonna listen to it this week mm. I'm uh, I'm halfway through. Uh, I think I just did Descent of Angels, and then I'm doing Angels of Caliban, and uh, just I, I I listen to them like once every three to six months. I get my little Dark Angels refresher on uh, because I have I have no chill. And yeah, straight <laughs> after that, bang, right back into Echoes of Eternity. Yeah, it's gonna be there. Can't wait. I mean, you know, I know how it ends. Tanya, what book are you up to at the moment? What are you reading? Um, so I am still just getting started on No No Fear. Um. I had to take like a month off of reading to do late nights of painting. Um, but now that my deadline has come and passed and I played that game, now I can actually sit down and have my reading quality time back. So, uh, nice. yeah, I think I'm like four chapters in or something now. Love it. I, yeah. I just love people getting the, the little really insightful lore dumps. Um, like, I mean, it's, it's, 
Oh, geez. Please feel free to take this out if it's a spoiler. Like when everyone like found out that uh, Armageddon was Ulanor. What? And if, so I, I, what book was that even in? Was that even in a book? No, but it's anyway. a camp- campaign supplement. So. Exactly. It was in a campaign supplement. It, was, it wasn't even hidden or, or drip fed or anything. It was just like, oh, yeah, this is why. And everyone's like, everyone just kind of cocked their head a little bit sideways. Their eyes went wide and they're like, oh, my God, there's my like my next six months of cooler talk, like water cooler talk. Uh, <laughs> it was like, did you know? And I'm like, yeah, oh, my God, it all makes sense now. And then you start going through the heresy. And then that happened and that happened. And then the first war of Armageddon, then the second one. And that's why they kept coming back and they jumped in the warp and it ended up there. And they're, 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 yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> Those things I love so much. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the trick. Is like trying to bottle that and to make sure it gets out there. And you know, with the lore and with Warhammer Plus, I had to get another year of Warhammer Plus. I mean, because the figures are, of course, awesome, but then also the contents is good. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with that Terminator, but I'm going to find something at cool. This, at this point, Red would say, "Oh, but what about that awesome app, Adam?" And I, he would say some <laughs> little quippy, dry something, and I'd be like, hoo, hoo, "Red, good job." <laughs> the Dark Angels yep. of Chaos as well. <laughs> well You'll done. get that sass next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you filled I in. It. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> the more stuff, I mean, and also you got to think the Adeptus and Mechanicus, you know, I mentioned that again, we're picking on them a little bit, but they're still kind of a fairly new faction as far as a playable faction. I don't know, yeah. man. The the hype for Votan is pretty real right now. Like the passion is there and it's not even out yet. Evoking all that nostalgia. Yeah, we'll be yeah. talking about them soon as soon as we can. Uh, oh. does, does the does the land train or the big well the big uh, caravan I don't know what you call it the big one the the big model the big moving fortress it's, it's a fortress yeah yeah does that remind anyone of their like lunar buggy they got for Christmas when they were eight years old <laughs> made of Lego I think I know what you're talking about look there's there is, well, dead we'll set. Save, there is a sorry yeah well yeah we'll save the Votan uh, discussion before we we can like really. Look at those and, and and break them down. I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to do so at some point. I don't know where it comes from, but there is a deep held reservoir of nostalgia that they stroke. And I wasn't around for second edition to play to play the original, so I'm trying to figure out where this feeling, you know, welling up inside me is coming from. And I swear, it's, <laughs> it's some Lego Lego. You just feel compelled. Yeah. She does, in the GW's. Mid-90s. GW's sitting in their in their offices going, got him. Got him. That's very got, got him. him. There it is. There it is. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's exactly the notes we wanted to hit. Yeah, I was like, I mean, you know, you know, I said, you know, I was only gonna paint blood angels if I was gonna paint marines, but these aren't marines, you know? Mm. It's not power armor. Yeah. Just uh, some kind of armor is, might be cool. Is there a red sub faction? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, well, there was what there was a figure preview that wore red armor. I don't know if that's a faction or, uh, or what. Mate, you're in. Yeah, it's already it's already over. <laughs> I think that was actually my <laughs> post on Twitter. It was like, well, you know, I do like red power armor. You know, what I'm saying. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but I'm actually thinking about trying to go for like a yellow or something. I don't. Yeah. Oh, uh, out. Use that new yellow paint. That's so amazing. Oh, there you go. That new contrast. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Okay, well, you know, twist my arm. There we go. I guess case closed. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see as we get closer to you know, hopefully being able to talk about those if we if uh, if we do get any information. Uh, speaking of yellow, though, that all the horse heresy stuff that's coming out has uh, like painting instructions on the on it to either paint the sons of Horus or the imperial fist because that's what came in the, the starter box. Oh yeah, so it's kind of neat. And those, I mean, it doesn't. It's not a tutorial, but just sometimes just knowing what colors to use or they or anybody used for a recipe is sometimes very helpful. So like my yeah. Sylvaneth yeah. color scheme is right out of the like the, the whatever one of the tutorials in the back of the the how to the instructions on to build your models. Like, so it's. Take take any information you can. Try to turn it into something something good. But yellow is that, a challenging color. I think that those are really good because sometimes people just really don't know where to start. Like if it's mm. your first army and you're like, I am so overwhelmed at this paint rack. What do I even buy? And then you've got your shopping list right there. I think it's great. Yeah. You go in there. Exactly. You're looking at like, which you, I know I need a base coat and I need a highlight color. And sometimes you can like, screw that up. There, <laughs> There's like three yellows here. Which one do I choose? You the know? worst. The worst mm. I've done is blue. It's like I don't know how to highlight blue. Like what shade I, is highlights blue? Who knows? I, I just I just add white to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. mix my own. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. That works too. I mean, it does. I mean, it's in a pinch. 
I mean, there's, um, if you are highlighting or building something, starting something new and you don't know where to go, that is actually a really good thing to do because you probably have I, white. I actually found that intimidating at first. I don't know about you guys, but I thought I, the, the idea of um, presuming I know about mixing colors better than G-Dub or Vallejo or P3, I actually found intimidating when I first started. I was like, shouldn't I just go with what they think and what they say highlights this, this color? Why no, you definitely I, should because uh, they've spent time on figuring that out you will screw it up yeah. otherwise i mean <laughs> and i did but then now i'm into the ah who cares just, just shove it on it's fine if it you know because the fear is is that unless you mix a whole pot of the stuff it might look different unit to unit because you're using a different you know puddle of yeah. that same ratio or perceived ratio um, and that was always such a huge fear of mine of but this is at the start when i was uh you know i was fearful of a lot of things back then if mostly because I was really, and most of those things came because I was very poor. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of money, so if I ruined a ruined a, a model, uh, that was it. It's not like I could replace it or anything. Yeah, I mean, no shame in that. Yeah, it's, and also with like a quick highlight, since we're kind of on the subject now, that I might as well do a little hobby thing. Is you know, and I know we mentioned this before, but as people are going to be starting new armies and you know maybe getting into heresy or any of these other games or whatever, is you know, if you have just your base coat and a dark wash and you're one of those folks that does an all over wash, your base coat can then become the highlight. Yes, you can re-highlight with the base coat. That's right. That's how I do it. There's plenty of places on the models that that I do that to this day, even though I try to get a little fancy and think everything <laughs> has to, you know, have a, a highlight color. But no, you paint a you paint a pouch or something and put null oil or you know, whatever the new color is over over the top of it, basilicon gray, you could highlight it whatever the base coat the, whatever you base coated that with and it will get you a pretty good it'll get you good enough hmm. my tip if people want to sort of do their first forays into mixing their own paint colors for highlights is just to keep a journal as you go um with your ratios in it so that when you go back to do another model or another unit in the same paint scheme, you just have something to reference back to. Um, so if your highlight is something that's other than just one-to-one, -one, um, as they quite often can be, depending on if you want higher or lesser contrast in your highlights, you just keep a diary, uh, keep a little ratio, um, keep notes as well about like the consistency of the paint that you're going for. So if you're doing a little trial and error and you like the highlight layer a little bit thinner, like a little waterier, um, maybe put your ratio of paint to water in there as well. Did you hear that, young Adam? I did. It's a great idea, actually. <laughs> Write it down. That and, is actually, um, I started doing that a year or so ago, and it has saved me more than once. Yeah. I actually have a multimedia sketchbook like that I use. So if I want to, I can actually mix the paint and then paint it into the book so that oh I God. have an actual like visual reference of the color that I'm going for. Um, and Man, that, that can I'm, be indispensable. I'm still painting back in the Renaissance, like... <laughs> that's an incredible tech wow <laughs> learning all kind of stuff uh, well folks idea. i think that's our show for this week i know we've been kind of all over the place but you know we actually have been all over the place in the last weekend and, <laughs> and trying to <laughs> tell y'all a little bit about what we've been up to and uh yeah it's, it's been a it's been a ride variety is the spice well, Adam and uh, Tanya, Red will be back next week. Can't wait, mate. Yeah. Uh, let us know if y'all playing stuff out there. Did you? Uh, did you? Did we uh, see each other at Nova? Let me know. Hit me up on Twitter at Warmaster underscore TPM or at Instagram at fight, Fights with Dice. Uh, maybe think about getting a shirt. Definitely should get a shirt. And uh, yeah, five star reviews. We'll see y'all next week. Premium body coverage product. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>